Hello, I'm Michael Bronstein. I'm a professor at Imperial College London and head of graph learning research at Twitter. I will talk about geometric deep learning. I guess you are all familiar with deep learning, so let me decipher the word geometric. And for this purpose, allow me to take you back in history. For almost 2000 years, the word geometry was synonymous with Euclidean geometry, simply because no other types of geometry existed. Euclid's monopoly came to an end in the 19th century when Lobachevsky, Boyai, Gauss, Riemann and others constructed the first examples of non-Euclidean geometries. Together with the development of projective geometry, an entire zoo of different geometries emerged, with mathematicians debating which geometry is the true one and what actually defines a geometry. A way out of this pickle was shown by a young German mathematician Felix Klein, appointed in 1872 as a professor in the small Bavarian University of Erlangen. In a research paper that entered the history of mathematics as the Erlangen program, Klein proposed approaching geometry as the study of invariants or symmetries, the properties that remain unchanged under some class of transformations. This approach created clarity by showing that different geometries could be defined by an appropriate choice of symmetry transformations formalized using the language of group theory. The impact of the Erlangen program on geometry and mathematics in general was very profound. It also spilled into other fields, especially physics, where symmetry considerations allowed to derive conservation laws from the first principles, an astonishing result known as Noether's theorem. It took several decades until this fundamental principle for the notion of gauge invariance in its generalized form developed by Young and Mills in 1954 proved successful in unifying all the fundamental forces of nature with the exception of gravity. This is what is called the standard model and it describes all the physics we currently know. I can only repeat the words of a Nobel winning physicist, Philip Anderson, that it's only slightly overstating the case to say that physics is the study of symmetry. You may wonder at this point, what does it all have to do with deep learning? I believe that the current state of affairs in the field of deep learning reminds a lot the situation in geometry in the 19th century. On the one hand, in the past decade, deep learning has brought a revolution in data science and made possible many tasks previously thought to be beyond reach. On the other hand, we now have a zoo of different neural network architectures for different types of data, but few unifying principles. As a consequence, it is difficult to understand the relations between different methods, which inevitably leads to the reinvention and rebranding of the same concepts. So we need some form of geometric unification in the spirit of the Erlangen program that I call geometric deep learning. It serves two purposes. First, to provide a common mathematical framework to derive the most successful neural network architectures. And second, to give a constructive procedure to build future architectures in a principled way. The term itself, geometric deep learning, I made it up for my ERC grant in 2015, and it became popular after a paper we wrote for the IEEE signal processing magazine. Geometric deep learning is now used almost synonymously with graph neural networks, but I hope to show you that it's part of a much broader picture. If we look at machine learning, at least in its simplest setting, it's essentially a function estimation problem. We are given the outputs of some unknown function on a training set, let's say label dog and cat images, and try to find a function from some hypothesis class that fits well the training data and allows to predict the outputs on previously unseen inputs. What happened in the past decade is that the availability of large high quality data sets such as ImageNet coincided with growing computational resources, GPUs, allowing to design rich function classes that have the capacity to interpolate such large data sets. Neural networks appear to be a suitable choice to represent functions because even with the simplest construction, like the perceptron shown here, we can produce a dense class of functions using just two layers which allows us to approximate any continuous function to any desired accuracy. We call this property universal approximation. The setting of this problem in low dimensions is a classical problem in approximation theory that has been studied to death in the past century. We have very precise mathematical control of the estimation errors. But the situation is entirely different in high dimensions. We can quickly see that in order to approximate even a simple class of, let's say, Lipschitz continuous functions, like an example shown here, a superposition of Gaussian blobs put in the quadrants of a unit cube, the number of samples grows very fast with the dimension. It is in fact exponential, so we get a phenomenon colloquially known as the curse of dimensionality.
And since modern machine learning methods need to deal with data in thousands or even millions of dimensions, the curse of dimensionality is always there, making such a naive approach to learning impossible. This is perhaps best seen in computer vision problems like image classification. Even tiny images tend to be very high dimensional, but intuitively they have a lot of structure that is broken and thrown away when we parse the image into a vector to feed it into the simple perceptron neural network. If the image is now shifted by just one pixel, the vectorized input will be very different, and the neural network will need to be shown a lot of examples in order to learn that shifted inputs must be classified in the same way. The remedy for this problem in computer vision came from the classical works in neuroscience by Hubel and Wiesel, the winners of the Nobel Prize in Medicine for the study of the visual cortex. They showed that brain neurons are organized into local receptive fields, which served an inspiration for a new class of neural architectures with local shared weights. First the neocognitron of Fukushima and then the convolutional neural networks, the seminal work of Jan de Kahn, where weight sharing across the image effectively solved the curse of dimensionality. Let me now show another example. What you see here is my favorite molecule of caffeine, represented as a graph. The nodes here are atoms and edges are chemical bonds. If we were to apply a neural network to this input, for example, to predict some chemical property, like its binding energy to some receptor, we could again parse it into a vector. But this time you see that any arrangement of the node features will do, because in graphs, unlike images, we don't have a preferential way of ordering the nodes. And molecules appear to be just one example of data with irregular non-Euclidean structure on which we would like to apply deep learning techniques. Social networks are another prominent example. These are gigantic graphs with hundreds of millions of nodes. We also have interaction networks or interactomes in biological sciences, manifolds and meshes in computer graphics, and so on. All these are examples of data waiting to be dealt with in a principled way. So let's look again at the multidimensional image classification example that at the first glance seemed hopeless because of the curse of dimensionality. Fortunately, we have additional structure that comes from the geometry of the input signal. We call this structure a geometric prior, and it's a general powerful principle that gives us optimism and hope in dimensionality cursed problems. In our example of image classification, the input image is not just a d-dimensional vector. It's a signal defined on some domain, which in this case is a two-dimensional grid. The structure of the domain is captured by a symmetry group, the group of 2D translations in our example, which acts on the points on the domain. In the space of signals, the group actions on the underlying domain are manifested through what is called the group representation. In our case, it's simply the shift operator, a d by d matrix that acts on the d-dimensional vector. This geometric structure of the domain underlying the input signal imposes structure on the class of functions f we are trying to learn. We can have functions that are unaffected by the action of the group, what we call invariant functions, and a good example is the image classification problem. No matter where the cat is located in the image, we still want to say it's a cat. So this is an example of shift invariance. On the other hand, we can have a case where the function has the same input and output structure. For example, image segmentation, where the output is a pixel-wise label mask. We want the output to be transformed in the same way as the input, or what we call an equivariant function. And again, in this example, what we see is shift equivariance. Another type of geometric prior is called scale separation. In some cases, we can construct a multi-scale hierarchy of domains by assimilating nearby points and producing also a hierarchy of signal spaces that are related by a coarse graining operator P. On these coarse scales, we can apply coarse scaled functions. We say that our function f is locally stable if it can be approximated as the composition of the coarse graining operator p and the coarse scale function f prime. While the original function f might depend on long-range interactions on the domain, in locally stable functions it is possible to separate the interactions across scales by first focusing on localized interactions and then propagating them towards the coarse scales. These two principles give us a general blueprint of geometric deep learning that we can recognize in the majority of popular deep neural architectures. We can apply a sequence of equivariant layers and then an invariant global pooling layer, aggregating everything to a single output. And in some cases, we can also create a hierarchy of domains by some coarsening procedure that takes the form of local pooling in neural network implementations. This is a very general design that can be applied to different types of geometric structures, such as grids, 
homogeneous spaces with global transformation groups, graphs, and manifolds, where we have global isometry invariants as well as local gauge symmetries. We call these the 5G of geometric deep learning. The implementation of these principles leads to some of the most popular architectures that exist today in deep learning, such as convolutional networks emerging from translational symmetry, graph neural networks, deep sets and transformers implementing permutation invariants, and the intrinsic mesh CNNs used in computer graphics and vision that can be derived from gauge symmetries. I hope to show you that these methods are also very practical and allow to address some of the biggest challenges from understanding the biochemistry of proteins and drug discovery to detecting fake news. Let me start with graphs. Probably each of us has a different mental picture when we hear the word graph, but for me, maybe because of my work at Twitter, I first think of a social network that models relations and interactions between users. Mathematically, the users of a social network are modeled as nodes of the graph, and their relations are edges or pairs of nodes, which can be ordered, in this case we call the graph directed, or unordered, in this case the graph is undirected. The nodes can also have some features attached to them, modeled as d-dimensional vectors, say the age, gender, or birthplace of social network users in our example. A key structural characteristic of a graph is that we don't have a canonical way to order its nodes. So if we arrange the node feature vectors into a matrix, we automatically prescribe some arbitrary ordering of the nodes. The same holds for the adjacency matrix that represents the structure of the graph. If we number the nodes differently, the rows of the feature matrix and the corresponding rows and columns of the adjacency matrix will be permuted by some permutation matrix P. P is a representation of the permutation group and we have n factorial such elements. If we want to implement a function on the graph that provides a single output for the whole graph, like predicting energy in our molecular graph example, we need to make sure that its output is unaffected by the ordering of the input nodes. We call such f permutation invariant. If, on the other hand, we want to make node-wise predictions, for example, to detect malicious users in a social network, we want a function that changes in the same way as the input with the reordering of the nodes, or in other words, is permutation equivariant. A way of constructing a pretty broad class of tractable functions on graphs is using the local neighborhood of a node. We look at the nodes that are connected by an edge to a node i and aggregate their feature vectors together with the feature vector of the node i itself. Because we don't have a canonical ordering of the neighbors, this must be done in a permutation invariant way. So this local aggregation function that I denote by phi must be permutation invariant. When we apply this phi at every node of the graph and stack the results into a feature matrix, we get a permutation equivariant function f. The way how the local function phi is constructed is crucial and its choice determines the expressive power of the resulting architecture. When phi is injective, it can be shown that the neural network designed in this way is equivalent to the weisferrer lehmann graph isomorphism test. It's a classical algorithm in graph theory that tries to determine if two graphs are isomorphic. We say that two graphs are isomorphic if there exists an edge-preserving bijection between them, which can be represented by a permutation matrix that rearranges their adjacency matrices such that they are equal. The weisferrer lehmann algorithm is an iterative color refinement procedure that starts with all the nodes of the graph having the same color and then applies an injective function to the neighbor colors. This function has exactly the same structure as the local aggregation phi we defined before, and because it's injective, it produces distinct colors for differently structured neighborhoods. In this example, we have nodes with three blue neighbors that become yellow, and nodes with two blue neighbors that become green. This procedure is applied once again, and now we have three types of neighborhoods. Yellow, 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 green, green, and yellow, green, that are mapped into violet, red, and gray. If we try to refine the colors further, and they don't change anymore, the algorithm stops and outputs a histogram of colors. If another graph has a different histogram of colors, we can say for sure it's not isomorphic. But if we get two equal histograms, we actually don't know. The graphs might be isomorphic, so it is a necessary but insufficient condition. In fact, there are examples of graphs that are deemed equivalent by the weisferrer lehmann test, but they are not isomorphic, like the example shown here. The graph on the right has triangles, while the graph on the left doesn't and it can be shown that this test cannot count triangles in graphs. So here is a typical way the local aggregation function looks like in graph neural networks. We have a permutation invariant aggregation operator, such as sum or maximum, a learnable function psi that transforms the neighbor features, and another function phi that updates the features of node i using the aggregated features of its neighbors. 
there are lots of nuances on how to design each of these components, and this is a very active research topic in deep learning on graphs. But fortunately, most architectures fall into one of the following three flavors. The first flavor is convolutional. This is how some of the early works on graph neural networks looked like, originating from spectral analysis on graphs. In this setting, we aggregate neighbor features weighted by some fixed coefficients, Cij, that depend only on the structure of the graph, and can be interpreted as the importance of node j to the representation of node i. We will see that on grids, this scheme boils down to the classical convolution. The second flavor is based on attention, when the aggregation coefficients now depend on the features themselves. And in the most general flavor, we have a nonlinear function dependent on both feature vectors of node i and j, whose output can be regarded as a message that is sent to update the features of node i. Graph neural networks of this type are called message passing. In chemistry applications, they were introduced by Justin Gilmer from DeepMind and in computer graphics in our collaboration with Yu Wang and Justin Solomon from MIT. If you look at a typical graph neural network architecture, you will immediately recognize an instance of our geometric deep learning blueprint with the permutation group as the geometric prior. We have a sequence of permutation equivariant layers, often referred to as propagation or diffusion layers in the literature, and an optional global pooling layer to produce a single graph-wise output. Some architectures also include local pooling layers obtained using some form of graph coarsening that can also be learnable. Let me say a few words about some interesting special cases of graph neural networks. First, a graph with no edges is a set, and sets are also unordered. In this case, the most straightforward approach is to process each element in the set entirely independently by applying a shared function phi to their feature vectors. This translates into a permutation equivariant function over the set and is a special setting of graph neural network. This architecture is known as deep sets in deep learning or point net in computer graphics. As another extreme, instead of assuming that each element of a set acts on its own, we can assume that any two elements can interact. This translates into a complete or a fully connected graph. In this case, the convolutional flavor actually makes no sense because the aggregation will be over the set of all nodes, and thus the second argument of our function would be the same for all nodes. We can use an attention-based aggregation, which we can interpret as a form of learnable soft adjacency matrix, and I hope you can recognize the famous transformer architecture that is now very popular in natural language processing applications, and it is also a particular case of a graph neural network. I should say that transformers are commonly used to analyze sequences of text where the order of nodes is given. This node information is typically provided in the form of what is called positional encoding, an additional feature that uniquely identifies the nodes. Similar approaches exist for general graphs, and there are several ways we can encode the node positions. We showed one such way in a recent paper with my students, Georgos Buritsas and Fabrizio Frasca, where we counted small graph substructures, such as triangles or cliques, providing this way a kind of structural encoding that allows the message passing mechanism to adapt to different neighborhoods. This architecture that we call graph subtraction networks can be made strictly more powerful than the vice federal element test by appropriate choice of substructures. It is also a way to incorporate problem-specific inductive bias. For example, in molecular graphs, cycles are prominent structures. In organic chemistry, we have an abundance of what is called aromatic rings. And here again, you can see the caffeine molecule that has a six and a five cycle. What we observe in experiments with this architecture is that our ability to predict chemical properties of molecules improves dramatically if we count rings of size 5 or more. So you can see that even in the cases where the graph is not given as input, graph neural networks still make sense. Even when the graph is given, we don't necessarily need to stick to it in order to do message passing, and in fact a lot of recent approaches decouple the computational graph from the input graph. It can take the form of graph sampling, usually to address scalability issues, rewiring the graph, or using larger multi-hop filters where aggregation is performed also on the neighbors of the neighbors, like in a recent work we did at Twitter, which we call SIGN, scalable inception-like GNNs. We can also learn the graph on which to run a graph neural network that can be optimized for the downstream task. I call this setting latent graph learning. We can make the construction of the graph differentiable and backpropagate through it, and this graph can also be updated between different layers of the neural network. This is what we call dynamic graph CNN, the first architecture to implement latent graph learning that we did with colleagues from MIT. Perhaps in historical perspective, latent graph learning can be related to methods called manifold learning or nonlinear dimensionality reduction.
the key premise of manifold learning is that even though our data lives in a very high dimensional space, it has low intrinsic dimensionality. A metaphor for this situation is the Swiss roll surface. We can think of our data points as if they were sampled from a manifold. The structure of this manifold can be captured by a local graph that we can then embed into a low dimensional space, where doing machine learning, such as clustering, is more convenient. The reason why manifold learning never really worked beyond data visualization is that all these three steps are separate. While it's clear, for example, that the construction of the graph in the first step hugely affects the downstream task. With latent graph learning, we can bring new life to these algorithms. I call it manifold learning 2.0. We now have a way to build an end-to-end -end pipeline in which we build both the graph and filters operating on this graph as a graph neural network with latent graph structure. We have recently used a latent graph learning architecture we call differentiable graph module or DGM for automated diagnosis applications and show that we can consistently outperform GNNs with handcrafted graphs. Let me now move to another type of geometric structures we are all familiar with and perhaps show you a different perspective. Grids are also a particular case of graphs and a grid with periodic boundary conditions that I show here is what is called a ring graph. Compared to general graphs, the first thing to notice on a grid is that it has a fixed neighborhood structure. Not only that, the order of the neighbors is fixed. I remind you that on graphs we were forced to use a permutation invariant local aggregation function phi because we didn't have a canonical ordering of the neighbors. On the grid we do. We can always put the green first, then the red, and then the blue. If we choose a linear function with the sum aggregation operation, we get the classical convolution which, if we write it as a matrix, has a very special structure called a circulant matrix. A circulant matrix is formed by shifted copies of a single vector of parameters theta. These are exactly the shared weights in CNNs. Circulant matrices are very special. They commute. And in particular, they commute with a special circulant matrix that cyclically shifts the elements of a vector by one position. We call it the shift operator. So circulant matrices commute with shift, which is just another way of saying that convolution is a shift equivariant operation. Now, this statement works in both directions. Not only every circuit matrix commutes with shift, but also every matrix that commutes with shift is circuit. So what we get is that convolution is the only linear operation that is shift equivariant. And you can see here the power of our geometric approach. Convolution automatically emerges from translational symmetry. I don't know how about you, but when I studied signal processing, nobody really explained where convolution comes from it was just given as a formula completely out of the blue. Let me show you another nice thing. We know from linear algebra that commuting matrices are jointly diagonalizable, or there exists a common basis in which all convolutions amount to pointwise products. They become diagonal matrices. Since all circuit matrices commute, we can pick up one of them for the convenience of analysis, and it's easy to look at the eigenvectors of the shift. We can show that the eigenvectors of the shift operator are the discrete Fourier basis or the DFT. So all convolutions are diagonalized by the Fourier transform. The eigenvalues are actually given by the Fourier transform of the vector of parameters theta that forms the convolution. So you can see that even the Fourier transform also comes from the fundamental principle of symmetry. This relation between the convolution and the Fourier transform is called the convolution theorem in signal processing, and it gives us two ways to perform convolution, either by multiplying by a circuit matrix this corresponds to sliding a filter along our signal, or in the Fourier domain as element-wise product of the Fourier transforms of the signal and the filter. Let me now describe a more general case where our group formalism will be more prominent. We can think of convolution as a kind of pattern matching operation. In an image, this is done by sliding a window across the plane. Let me write it a bit more formally. We need to define a shift operator T that will shift the filter, which I denote here by psi, and an inner product that matches the filter to the image X. If we do it for every shift, we get the convolution. The special thing here is that the translation group can actually be identified with the domain itself. Each element of the group, a shift, can be represented as a point on the domain. This is not the general case, and in general, we'll have the filter transformed by the representation of the group, rho, and the convolution will now have values for every element of the group, G. It is easy to show that this group convolution is equivariant under the group action. Here is an example of how to do convolution on the sphere. And it's not some exotic construction. Spherical signals are pretty important, for example, in astrophysics, where a lot of observational data is naturally represented on the sphere 
like the cosmic microwave background radiation that I show here. Our group here is the special orthogonal group SO3 of rotations that preserve orientation. And its action on points on the sphere can be represented by an orthogonal matrix R that has determinant equal to 1. So the convolution is defined on SO3. We get a value of inner product for every rotation R of the filter. If we want to apply another layer of such convolution, we need to apply it on the SO3 group. It's a three-dimensional manifold on which points are rotations themselves. I denote them by Q. The sphere in this example is a non-Euclidean space, a manifold, but it is quite special. Every point on the sphere can be transformed into another point by an element of the symmetry group of rotations. So in a sense there is complete democracy among the points. In geometry we call such spaces homogeneous, and their key feature is a global symmetry structure. This global symmetry structure doesn't obviously hold for general manifolds. One thing that we know when we apply a sliding window on an image is that it doesn't matter which way we go from one point to another. We'll always arrive at the same result. The situation is dramatically different on a manifold. If we go along the green path or the blue path, we'll arrive at a different result. In differential geometry, we call it parallel transport, and the result of moving a vector on a manifold is path-dependent. A crucial difference between manifolds and Euclidean spaces is that manifolds are only locally Euclidean. We can map a small neighborhood of a point U to what is called the tangent space. The tangent spaces can be equipped with additional inner product structure that is called the Riemannian metric. It allows us to measure lengths and angles. If the manifold is deformed without affecting the metric, we say it's an isometric deformation. And isometries also form a group. So we can define an analogy of convolution on manifolds using a local filter applied in the tangent space. And if we make this construction intrinsic or express entirely in terms of the metric, we get deformation invariance, or invariance with respect to the isometry group of the manifold. This was in fact the very first architecture for deep learning on manifolds that we called geodesic CNNs. One important thing I didn't say is that because we are forced to work locally on the manifold, we don't have a global system of coordinates. We need to fix a local frame at each point, or a gauge, how physicists call it. The gauge can be changed arbitrarily at every point by applying a gauge transformation typically a local orientation preserving rotation. And we need to account for the effect of the gauge transformation on the filter by making it transform in the same way, such that the filter is gauge equivariant. What you can see here is again the comeback of our geometric deep learning blueprint, either in the form of invariance to the isometry group or equivariance to what is called the structure group of the tangent bundle of the manifold. The reason why we care about manifolds is that in computer vision and graphics, two-dimensional manifolds, or discrete surfaces, meshes, are a standard way of modeling 3D objects. What we gain from our geometric perspective is filters that can be defined intrinsically on the object, and this equips our deep learning architecture with invariance under inelastic deformations. One application where dealing with deformable objects is crucial is motion capture or mock-up, that is used in the production of expensive blockbuster movies. What you see here is a cheap markerless motion capture setup from a Swiss company called FaceShift. The company was bought by Apple in 2015 and its technology now powers the Animoji feature on the iPhone. What this video nicely shows, I think, is two prototypical problems in computer vision. The problem of shape analysis, where we are given the noisy face scan of the actor, captured by the sensor that has to be brought in correspondence with some canonical facial model, and the problem of synthesis where we need to deform this model to reproduce the input expression of the actor. Ten years ago, one would need a 3D sensor to produce this motion capture effect, and I myself was very adamant about it. Since there were no cheap real-time sensors with sufficient resolution on the market at that time, we had to build one. This was our startup in Vision, and here you can see a Eureka moment from 2011 where an FPGA implementation of our sensor prototype worked for the first time. InVision was acquired by Intel in 2012, where I spent the following eight years building what is now called the RealSense technology. RealSense was released in 2014 with this funny commercial featuring Sheldon Cooper from The Big Bang Theory, and I'm sorry that I always forget his real name, and it was the first mass-manufactured integrated 3D sensor that became a commercial success for Intel.
Fast forward 10 years and we don't need 3D input anymore for something similar to that motion capture video that I showed. We can actually have hybrid geometric deep learning architectures for 3D shape synthesis problems with a standard 2D CNN encoder that works on the input image or video and a geometric decoder that reconstructs a 3D shape. This was the work of my PhD student, Dominic Colon, and last year at CVPR we showed a demo of full body 3D avatars with detailed hands from purely 2D video input that ran on an old iPhone 10 times faster than real time. This was a collaboration with a startup Ariel AI that was acquired by Snap last year. Let me now talk about some applications of geometric deep learning, which is probably the part I am mostly excited about in this field. If we look at graphs, they are really ubiquitous. We can describe practically any system of relations or interactions as a graph, from nanoscales as models of individual molecules, to microscales looking at interactions between different molecules in our body, all the way to the macroscale, at which we can model social networks of whole countries or even the entire world. One thing that you often hear in the popular press in relation to social networks is the problem of misinformation or so-called fake news. There is empirical evidence that fake news spread differently on the social network and using graph learning we try to detect misinformation by looking at the spreading patterns of different stories. We got quite encouraging results and together with my students I founded a company called Fabula AI that commercialized this technology. In 2019, Fabula was bought by Twitter, where I currently had a group that does research on GraphML. And as you can imagine, graphs of different types, such as the follow graph or the engagement graph, are among the key data assets for Twitter. But if you ask me to pick just one application where I believe geometric deep learning is likely to produce the biggest impact, I think it's biological sciences and drug design. You may know that making new drugs is a very long and extremely expensive business. Bringing a new drug to the market takes more than a decade and costs more than a billion dollars. One of the reasons is the cost of testing, where many drugs fail at different stages. The space of possible drug-like molecules that can be chemically synthesized is extremely large, while on the other hand, we can test maybe just a few thousands of compounds in the lab or in the clinic. So there is a huge gap that has to be bridged, and it can be done by computational methods that perform virtual screening of the candidate molecules, predicting properties such as toxicity and target binding affinity. Graph neural networks have recently achieved remarkable success in virtual screening of drugs. Nowadays, they are already more accurate and orders of magnitude faster than traditional approaches. Last year, the group of Jim Collins at MIT used graph neural networks to predict antibiotic activity of different molecules, leading to the discovery of a new powerful antibiotic compound called halicin that originated as a candidate anti-diabetic drug. If we look at traditional small molecule drugs, one thing that characterizes them is that drugs are typically designed to attach to, or as chemists say, bind some pocket-like regions on the surface of a target molecule, which is usually a protein. Here you can see again my favorite molecule, caffeine. When I drink from this cup, it will get into my bloodstream, cross the blood-brain barrier, and attach itself to the adenosine receptor in the brain, its interface is cut out in this figure, so you can clearly see the deep pocket on the protein surface. More recently, the pharma industry is interested in drugs that disrupt or inhibit protein-to-protein -protein interactions, or PPIs, because most biochemical processes in our body, including those that are related to diseases, involve proteins that interact with each other. One of the most famous such mechanisms is the program Death Protein Complex. It is used in cancer immunotherapy for which the Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded in 2018. Since PPIs typically have flat interfaces like the program death ligand PDL1 protein I show here, they are usually considered undruggable by traditional small molecules. A promising new class of drugs is based on large biomolecules, peptides, proteins or antibodies that are engineered to address difficult targets. These drugs are called biologics and there are already several of them on the market. With my collaborators from EPFL, we developed a geometric deep learning architecture called Massif. It was on the cover of Nature Methods last year that allowed to design from scratch new protein binders. You can see three such examples that were experimentally confirmed to bind the PDL1 oncological target. Another promising direction towards cheaper and faster development of therapies is drug repositioning, when existing approved drugs are used against new targets, sometimes in combinations with other drugs. This is called combinatorial therapy or polypharmacy. 
Many such drug combinations may have unknown, potentially dangerous side effects, and graph neural networks were recently applied to predict them. These ideas are actually not limited to synthetic drugs. With collaborators from Imperial College and Vodafone Foundation, we took graph-based drug repositioning approaches to the domain of food. You may know that plant-based food ingredients are rich in compounds belonging to the same chemical classes as anti-cancer drugs. With every bite of food, we put thousands of bioactive molecules into our body. Most of them still remain largely unexplored by experts, not tracked by regulators, and unknown to the public at large. How many of you have heard, for example, about polyphenols, flavonoids, or indoles? So it's truly the dark matter of nutrition. The way we model the effect of molecules is by how they interact with protein targets. Since proteins interact with each other, the effect on one target ripples through the PPI graph and affects other proteins. A kind of network effect because in our body's biochemistry, a lot of the biomolecules are interrelated. If we now take a training set, for example, of drugs with known anti-cancer effect, we can train a classifier based on a graph neural network that predicts how likely a molecule is to be similar to an anti-cancer drug from the way it interacts with protein targets. We can then apply this classifier to other molecules contained in food for which we know the interactions with proteins. And this gives us a list of potential anti-cancer food molecules. Now I'm hugely simplifying here. The biggest part of this work that appeared in Nature Scientific Reports was actually to study the pathways affected by these molecules and to confirm their anti-cancer effect and lack of toxicity. But to make long story short, we constructed the anti-cancer molecular profiles of over 250 different food ingredients, and we see that there are prominent champions that we call hyperfoods, for example, tea, cabbage, celery, and sage. These are all rather common, cheap, and I dare say boring ingredients that we better add to our diet. Perhaps the coolest part of this project is that the ingredients we identified were used by the famous chef Bruno Barbieri to present short recipes for Christmas. If you wonder why he's in bed, this was part of the Vodafone Foundation citizen science campaign called Dream Lab. We collaborated with them to use the idle power of smartphones at night to make our computations. I think it's a good moment to end on this tasty note. So let me conclude. We started with this somewhat irreverent desire to imitate the Erlangen program in machine learning, trying to derive different deep learning architectures from fundamental principles of symmetry. This took us all the way from image classification to molecular gastronomy. All the approaches we've seen were instances of a common blueprint of geometric deep learning where the architecture emerged from the assumptions on the domain underlying our data and its symmetry group. In the past few years, geometric deep learning methods, especially graph neural networks, have exploded, leading to several success stories in industrial applications. And I think it's quite indicative that last year two major biological journals featured geometric deep learning papers on their cover, which means that it has already become mainstream and possibly will lead to new exciting results in fundamental sciences. Last but not least, I would like to acknowledge all my amazing collaborators and thank you for your attention.